whole world is a boat float. How in the world does a light bulb work? How in the world does a bird fly? Where in the world is the deepest spot in the ocean? Why in the world is the sky blue? Where in the world are the seven ancient wonders? Where in the world are the northern lights? How in the world does the moon affect the tides? How in the world does an electoral college work? How in the world do dicks and bikes work on the computer? How in the world do fish break? How in the world does a bridge work? Hey there. Welcome aboard the Airship Curiosity. I'm Pilot Lindy, and my passengers and I will take you around the world to show you how in the world. So, it's a perfect match. You have questions, and I know just where to find the answers. So, let's get started. Hmm, if something doesn't get done about that alarm, of course, that does mean a question. Where in the world does drinking water come from? Now there's a topic just dripping with information. So, off we go for H2O. To find out where drinking water comes from, the airship Curiosity has come to the source. And I mean, the real source. This picturesque setting is actually Lake Gaston, a man-made reservoir that is 35 miles long and borders North Carolina and Virginia. The lake has long been popular with fishermen and other water recreation enthusiasts. But as a reservoir, it serves a more serious purpose. It's a water source, and that's where drinking water begins its journey to your home. A water source can be surface water, like riv a river, lake, or stream, or it can come from an aquifer. An aquifer is a layer of water found deep in the ground. It's usually located in a bed of earth, gravel, or porous stone that yields water. The water is pumped from the source and then sent to a treatment facility where it's made safe for drinking and bathing. From that treatment facility, it's pumped through a series of pipes, valves, and storage facilities before it finally ends up at your tap. So how much water are we talking? Well, of course it varies by the size of the city or town and the demand by customers. A large city like Virginia Beach has more than 400,000 residents and can pump up to 36 million gallons a day. How much is that? Well, your bathtub holds about 50 gallons of water. So a million gallons would be 20,000 bathtubs. And 36 million? Well, your fingers will sure be wrinkled after soaking in those. Virginia Beach is the end of a 76-mile journey for a single drop of water. It starts at a, a surface water source, which is Lake Gaston. Uh, the water is sucked from, um, from the lake and it's brought into a large pumping facility. After large pipes draw the water from the lake, it is then pumped for miles in a pipeline. Eventually, that water leaves the pipes and begins a journey through a series of reservoirs and small holding lakes until it arrives at a treatment station where the water is made safe to drink. The treatment process is very important because it takes out um, any bacteria or, um, or harmful elements that are found in our, in our surface water. It makes it clean um, by adding chemicals like chlorine and also um, chemicals like um, fluoride, which helps keep our, our teeth safe from cavities. So it's a very important process. The water can look clean in a river or stream, but there's plenty that needs to be cleaned up before you fill your glass. One of um, the first steps is just a screening process to filter out any organic material, logs, leaves, branches, that kind of thing. Um, and then you get into the finer um, treatment process where, um, where small um, particles in the water are actually, they are added, chemicals are added where they're clumped together and um, so they can be filtered out uh, more easily. Actually, there are quite a few steps involved and the final product is quite different than when the water comes in. Look like the surface of the moon there? Nope, that's just a combination of particles and chemicals used to trap them. Ugh. But that means that clean, safe water will soon be on its way to your sink or water fountain at school. But that's not the end of the story. There are um, water professionals throughout uh, the industry and throughout each city that test the water every day. They monitor the storage facilities, make sure that um, the water stays clean and safe and um, is available for use by residents whenever it's needed. About 75% of the surface of the earth is covered with water, but very little is used for drinking. 
You see, nearly 97% of the world's water is undrinkable because of things like salt. Another 2% is frozen in ice caps and glaciers, leaving only 1% of all the water in the world to drink. So it's important to conserve, and you can help. For example, how many gallons of water are used if you leave it running while you brush your teeth? Five? Twenty-five? A hundred? And the answer is five gallons wasted down the drain. It doesn't seem like much, but every little bit counts. So turn off that faucet. Okay, everyone dried off now? How about... Uh, yes, that annoying sound means another question. How in the world does email work? Yep, there's nothing like sitting down at the computer, writing a quick note to a pen pal, hitting the send button, and off it goes halfway around the world. But how does it work? Let's find out. To find out just how email works, the airship curiosity has come to a halt over a place where technology rules. Located on the Virginia Beach campus of Tidewater Community College, the Advanced Technology Center offers tomorrow, today, with a focus on computers. So you can be pretty sure teachers and students have a pretty good idea how email works. Well, email is really an electronic message that's being sent through, uh, through the Internet. That happens through a group of computers hooked together known as a network. So basically, your message travels through one computer to another until it's received on another computer. That's very unlike what we know as snail mail, where we put a letter in the mail and use a post office to send it out. Before email, you would write a letter to Grandma, put it in an envelope, slap a stamp on it, put it in a mailbox, and off it went. Now? So you're actually writing your message on the computer now instead of on a piece of paper. And then, really, the computer really packages it in a sense and sends it out to the proper, you know, to the proper actual mail server. Of course, any good letter starts with an address. Well, the email actually has an address, and it would typically be the username with the at symbol, and then they call it a domain name. A domain name is the name that identifies a website. You know, like MySpace.com. MySpace is the domain name. And if you really think about how mail goes uh, from a letter to the post office, it's really, if you take that same idea, the letter, the mail from your computer, the actual email from your computer is going to what they call an email server. When a message is sent to an email server, it finds a person's email box and is stored away. When the person goes to the computer to check email, the stored messages get downloaded. So computers have RAM and ROM and bits and bytes. Sound complicated? But email runs off of four simple steps. So if I were going to write an email to my friend, and my friend lived in California, I would send the email, but the email would go to a local email server first. And then that email server, my local email server, would send it to the actual other, the, what we call the destina destination email server. That could be anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the world. And then it would store it there until my friend would check his email and then it would download to his computer. And if you have a good connection, this could happen in a matter of seconds. Now all of this happens thanks to protocols. A protocol is simply a set of rules. And one is called SMTP, which is, stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. And that's the set of rules that actually is designed to send your email to the local mail server. And the other protocol, there's another one, is called POP, or Post Office Protocol. And that's the actual protocol that allows you to download the messages. So, email is today's sticky notes, a quick little way of dropping a line. And though it's easy, consider these three things before sending one off. Keep it formal. Always check your spelling and grammar. And the third thing? The tone of the message. You're not speaking face to face, and some things you write may be misunderstood. So be clear. Did you know that according to research, 210 billion emails are sent every day? That means more than two million are sent every second of the day. That's a lot of mail. Right now we have to hit the send button and take a break, but only for a minute. See you soon. What is that?
And now, another fact of ours. Our country depends on citizen participation. But if you don't participate, things get messy. Think if you didn't participate in your family, and you didn't discuss what you wanted. Instead of getting ice cream, you'd get sour cream. Instead of going on a roller coaster, you got a toaster. Instead of playing ball, you play doll. If you don't participate, you don't get what you want. How do you participate? Write your representatives a letter, send them an email, or give them a call. Study up on the issues by reading the newspaper and watching the news. Volunteer on a campaign and get your candidate elected. And when you turn 18, you can vote. And that's another fact of Congress. Welcome back aboard the Airship Curiosity. So far, we've learned all about drinking water and email. Now let's dig a little deeper. I was going to ask if that could be any more annoying, but I don't want to know the answer. Answer, how about another question? What in the world do we find in a cavern? A wonder of nature, caverns are quite simply large caves in the earth. These underground rooms contain some rather amazing sights. Ready to take a look? Strap yourselves in. To discover what's underground, the Airship Curiosity glides above ground of the largest East Coast attraction of its kind, the Ray Caverns. Hidden beneath the mountains near Shenandoah National Park, the Ray Caverns were discovered in early 1878 and opened to visitors later that year. Back then, visitors paid 50 cents for an underground journey, a whopping dollar if they wanted lights turned on. The Appalachian Mountains run from Maine to Georgia, but these Virginia hills are home to numerous underground marvels. These are limestone mountains, and limestone is one of the softest materials in nature, easily eroded and dissolved by water. So where does that water come from? Well, it actually begins as rainwater. When it rains, see, the water sinks into the surface as it passes through grass and plant life, and when it comes in contact with limestone, the limestone dissolves. As the droplets come into a cavern, they put out a gas called carbon dioxide. When it evaporates, it leaves a bit of calcite on the ceiling. A very common mineral, calcite is essentially a crystal in the form of limestone. It's also found in marble and chalk. As the process continues, more calcite is left behind, leading to incredible formations. Stalactites will form from the ceiling, and if the water is flowing quick enough, it falls down to the floor. That same process continues on the floor, and then we have stalagmites growing up from the floor. Remember, stalactites with a C form on the ceiling. Stalagmites are those rising from the floor. When a stalactite and a stalagmite come together, they form a column or a pillar. Another formation found in the caverns is flowstone, which occurs when water seeps over a wall and forms something that looks like drapery. This process doesn't happen overnight. In fact, they grow at a very slow one cubic inch every 120 years. Luray's deepest spot is 164 feet beneath the earth, so you could stack eight two-story houses inside or even the Statue of Liberty. Luray features some very unique items like this large stalactite, which was jarred from the ceiling in an earthquake. Luray is also home to the fried eggs and the largest musical instrument in the world, the great stalagpipe organ. Because the formations are porous and hollow, air-driven cylinders which respond to the keys on the organ strike the hanging forms actually playing musical notes. How about this formation? The surface of another planet? Or an illusion? Another unique feature is the diversity of color. Remember calcite? Its natural color is white, but water is colored by the impurities in the soil it passes through. 
but here in the United States, most caverns have a reddish or an orangish brown color, which comes from the iron content in the soil, which is the dominant mineral in the soil in this region. And so, next time you find yourself in the mountains, there really is more than what meets the eye. So on the surface, we see the huge mountains and the trees, and it's just unbelievable that beneath the earth, there can be these huge, huge chambers with formations, some so, so delicate, some so huge and massive, the colors, the textures. Now, another out of the world brain game. Some of the race stalactites and stalagmites took seven million years to grow. But you don't have to wait that long. In fact, you can grow some at home in just a few days. Here's what you'll need. Two jars, water, Epsom salts, string, small weights, and a plate. First, fill two jars with warm water. Then mix in Epsom salts until no more will dissolve. Next, wet a piece of string and tie a weight to each end. Drop one end of the string into each jar. Then put a plate between the two jars with the string hanging over the plate. Finally, check your cave at least once a day to see if stalactites and stalagmites have formed. Now doesn't that just rock your world? With that, we'll take a break, but stick around. There's more adventure around the corner. Behind me is Old Quarters Number 1. This is where Abraham Lincoln came to orchestrate the capture of Norfolk and the destruction of the CSS Virginia. Lincoln is frustrated by the delays of General McClellan, whose 121,000 man army is here at Fort Monroe and yet cannot advance against Richmond because of the Confederate defenses. Consequently, Lincoln comes here to this house and will orchestrate the capture of Norfolk on May 10, 1862. Left without a base, the Confederate ironclad, the CSS Virginia, is forced to be destroyed by her own crew. She had been a thorn in our side for a long time, Lincoln said, but now she is gone. And it all happened here in Hampton Roads. Are. Welcome back aboard the Airship Curiosity as we sail through the skies for fun and adventure. Maybe I can order a new one of those. What in the world was the Battle of Ironclads? Some know it as the Battle of Hampton Roads. Some, the battle between the Monitor and Merrimack. Call it what you want, but it was an encounter that changed naval warfare forever. Let's take a look. To get the scoop on why this meeting of two unusual vessels changed navies and ships forever, we head to a place that holds a remarkable piece of history. The Mariner's Museum in Newport News, Virginia, is one of the largest maritime museums in the country and is filled to the crow's nest with artifacts and items that celebrate the seagoing adventure. At the center of all this is something that made all the headlines in the 60s. Um, that's the 1860s, at the height of the American Civil War. These cannons and round gun turret are part of what was called a cheese box on a raft, the USS Monitor. What makes the Monitor unique besides its revolutionary design is the fact that she took part in what some say is the first modern naval battle, the Battle of Hampton Roads. Well, a lot of people think that the Battle of Hampton Roads was the, the battle between the two first ironclads, but that's not really the case. It was actually the first battle between ironclad ships, but they weren't the first ones. Hampton Roads is the body of water between Norfolk and Portsmouth, Virginia, and the peninsula cities Hampton and Newport News. In nautical terms, a roadstead, or roads for short, is a place outside a harbor where a ship can lie at anchor. Sounds peaceful, doesn't it? But this safe anchorage between Craney Island and Portsmouth and Newport News was anything but peaceful in March of 1862. That's because it became the scene for a meeting of two odd-looking ships, both of which were covered in metal. 
Remember, back in the days of the Civil War, most ships had sails and masts. Navies were just beginning to experiment with steam power. At that time, an interesting experiment was going on at the Gosport Naval Shipyard in Portsmouth, Virginia. The Confederates were outfitting a former Union ship with metal plating. And that was because the Secretary of the Confederate Navy, Stephen Mallory, he realized he didn't have a lot of ships for his Navy. So he had to build one, and it had to be a very, very strong and special one. And that's how the CSS Virginia came about. Known as the Merrimack before she landed in rebel hands, the renamed Virginia was to be the Confederacy's secret weapon, the first ironclad warship. Converting the Merrimack into the ironclad Virginia ultimately resulted in a strange looking vessel. It almost looked like a floating barn roof um, that became the CSS Virginia. Um, she was ironclad, um, although she still had the Merrimack's old hull underneath and her old kind of cranky engines. Around the same time, the Union Navy knew they were going to need ironclads. Three were considered, but it was President Abraham Lincoln who decided on the monitor design submitted by John Erickson. What really made the monitor stand out was the revolving gun turret. And that, of course, is the feature that most people recognize with the monitor. What the gun turret did, though, was free up the vessel from having to aim the entire ship at an enemy. In this case, you could turn the, the turret and fire your guns in any direction. The designer knew that many sailors would be reluctant to serve on such a different ship, so he paid to make the interior very inviting. The monitor had walnut wood, painted walls, carpets on the decking, even laced curtains. But she was not designed for the ocean. With just 18 inches of the deck above water, she doesn't do well in rough seas and almost sank on her way to Virginia. So what you have to understand is when the Monitor and her crew arrived in Hampton Roads the evening of March 8th, these guys hadn't had any sleep for almost a day and a half. The Virginia spent the day of March 8th attacking the Federal Fleet in Hampton Roads. In a very short space of time, the Virginia sank the USS Cumberland, set the Congress on fire, and damaged a lot of other vessels. The next target was the USS Minnesota and the crew of the Monitor was determined to protect her. And on the morning of March 9, 1862, the two ships began their duel in front of thousands of spectators. Keep in mind, people on both sides of Hampton Roads had seen what the Virginia had done the day before, so you can be sure even more people were out on March 9th to see what she would do that day. What they saw was two ships firing at each other and neither inflicting any damage. What they also saw was a change in naval warfare. But in terms of a battle, can you say one side won or not? Not really, it was a draw. Um, but what you really have are these two experimental vessels pounding away at each other. And you've got observers from England, from France, watching this and understanding that this was a real change in technology, a real change in how warfare would be fought from that point on, on the seas. And the fate of those two famous ships, the Virginia, or Merrimack, ran aground and was burned by her crew so it wouldn't end up in unfriendly hands. And the Monitor? She sank off the coast of Cape Hatteras on New Year's Eve, 1862. We'll look at how the remains of the Monitor are being pulled from the depths of the sea in our next episode. <laughs> I think we know what that is. How in the world does a hot air balloon work? Man has been sailing along in hot air balloons since 1783. Over the years, these colorful objects have been used as military tools, advertisements, and just a great way to spend a morning. And in 200 years of ballooning, very little has changed. Oh, why talk about it? Let's take a ride. For a topic this hot, the airship Curiosity is wasting no time heading for the hills. Located along the Ravana River, Charlottesville, Virginia is nestled in the Southwest Mountains and is just east of the Blue Ridge and the Shenandoah Valley. Charlottesville is home to the University of Virginia, Monticello, the home of Thomas Jefferson, and quite a few hot air balloon enthusiasts. Crisp autumn mornings find the balloonist up with the sun putting together the pieces for a morning flight. Well, you have to get your basket assembled. 
lay it down, attach the balloon, then we use an inflation fan to cold pack or cold inflate the balloon. Mandy Rafano has been a licensed hot air balloon pilot for 10 years. Once she and her crew get the basket in place and the balloon inflated, it's time to heat up the air inside using propane burners. How hot? How about 212 degrees or so? That's the temperature that water begins to boil. The burners continue to fill the balloon with heat until the ambient air is hot enough to lift it off the ground. Used as an adjective, the word ambient means surround, encircling. In the balloon's case, the surrounding air is heated up to cause lift. Hot air balloons slowly fill and then rise majestically in the early morning light. Colorful for sure, but did you know that there's basic science at work here? Yep, the ideal gas law and our old friend Archimedes and his famous principle. For example, the ideal gas law is a mathematical relationship between the volume pressure and temperature of a gas. For a given quantity of gas, the pressure P multiplied by the volume V divided by the temperature T remains a constant. Huh? That means when a gas like air is heated in a balloon, its volume will increase. So, the volume increases, it fills the balloon, soon it's full and flows out the hole at the bottom. Hot air contains fewer molecules and will be less dense than cooler air. Remember our old friend Archimedes? When we learned about how a boat floats, Archimedes told us that when an object is suspended in a fluid, the buoyant force acting on an object is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. So, if an object is less dense than the fluid, it floats. Although hot air balloons can come in many shapes and sizes, they all have three essential parts. The burner, which heats the air, the balloon envelope, which holds the air, and the basket, which carries the passengers. Is that horizon up there? How's it doing on the surface here? So, what's missing from this picture? How about a steering wheel or a rudder? Well, we actually can steer the balloons depending on the varying winds of the day. If the winds allow us, we can almost steer them like an airplane just by finding different layers to ride out. Skilled pilots can read the air, so to speak, and maneuver the balloon horizontally by changing the vertical direction. To move in a particular direction, a pilot ascends and descends to the appropriate level and rides with the wind. Since wind speed generally increases as you get higher in the atmosphere, pilots can also control horizontal speed by changing altitude. We may find uh, due south at a thousand feet and east down on the surface, and maybe west up high. A pilot heats the air with the burners to make the balloon rise. To descend, there are two methods. Either let the balloon start to cool off, it'll initiate a slower descent, or this particular balloon that you flew in had one large deflation vent called the parachute valve. We'll give a good pull on the red line for about three seconds and that'll vent a large amount of air out and initiate a much faster descent. And eventually that descent leads to a landing where a balloon chaser helps bring it to the ground. After all, ballooning definitely has its ups and downs. And did you know that in order to pilot a hot air balloon, a person must earn a pilot certificate from the Federal Aviation Administration, the same group who issues certificates for airplane pilots. See, you got to know your stuff. Well, with that, we need to sail on out of here. So until the next time, keep looking up for the airship curiosity. When you see us, maybe we'll have an answer or two for you. You know, cool stuff like where in the world do meteors come from? How in the world are clouds formed? What in the world is it?